Welcome to Oak Forest United Methodist Church. We are glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. Um, this is an exciting day in our church because we also have stone soup after church. So stay for a nice soup lunch. And then after that, we'll come up here to decorate the sanctuary, get it ready for the Christmas season for Advent. And today also, at that same time, we'll be having our monthly children's program. So there is something for everyone. And then after Thanksgiving, we'll enter in the Advent season. And so we have Advent boxes there in the narthex. So grab one box for a household, and then there's plenty of hot chocolate. So go ahead and grab some of that as well. And grab a booklet that will instruct you throughout that season. And so we are excited about all of these different things that are coming, as long, along with our Advent Bible study. We are looking forward to that. And so the information's in the bulletin. And so we are thankful to come together and get to worship and praise. And so you are invited to stand as you're able as Cheryl leads us into the call to worship. Come, let us celebrate the goodness of God. God has blessed us with God's great love. Let us come to this time, letting go of our words. Let us come to this time, praising God. Come, now is the time to worship. We come rejoicing, for God is so good to us. Amen. Please remain standing as you are able and sing. Come be thankful for the time. together and we worship and pray 
praise God, but we also come together as a community as we pray. So let us be in a time of prayer. From the first day of Advent so long ago, we come full circle to the celebration of the reign of Christ, or also Christ the King. So we have witnessed this wonderful birth, the great healing moments, the teachings that have sustained people throughout the centuries. And Lord, we cry in sorrow at the crucifixion and rejoice in the absolute joy on the sunrise of Easter when Jesus conquered our greatest fear of death. We celebrated the great good news of the disciples as they risked everything to finally proclaim the good news to all people. And so now as we come to the Sunday, we invite Jesus to enter our hearts. Sovereign Lord Jesus, come into our hearts today and take your reign. Remind us that your kingdom is a kingdom of hope and light, in which there is no darkness, fear, or sadness. You have called us to be the kingdom people. Help us, Lord, in living with that knowledge that we will go forward and share peace and justice and hope, and that we will allow you to be the ruler that we follow after. There are many who do not acknowledge your presence, and we name you, Lord, and we pray for them in our hearts. But in your infinite love and mercy, you have acknowledged and claimed them, and we give thanks. Help us to be the kind of disciples that welcome everyone with words of kindness, that offer acts of mercy and peace to all who need to proclaim Christ risen and glorified. Lord, we have so many things on our hearts. And so in our hearts, we name the people and situations that are in need of your healing and comforting touch. We ask that you also open our hearts to that same healing and comfort. Remind us that we are never out of your grace and mercy, that we know that you will give us the strength and wisdom to be true disciples as we celebrate and honor you now and forever, as we pray together the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
something we haven't done in a while in a church service. Of course, throughout this time, we've been collecting tithes and offerings, but today will be the first time in a while that we've actually had them collected during the service. And so let us, I'm going to call the ushers forward, and we'll pray over these offerings we're about to receive. Let us bless these gifts. With gratitude for all the blessings you have poured into our lives, Lord Jesus, we come bringing these, our gifts, that they may be used in service for those in need. Bless these gifts and those who have given them, that they may be truly be a blessing in your holy name. Amen.
Good morning. I'd like to invite all the children to come up and sit with me. Good morning, Avery. <laughs> Good morning, John Healy. All right, I have something to show you guys. What's this? I'm guessing it's a crown. Were you going to say crown, Avery? Yeah, that's what it is. I'm glad y'all could tell. Um, who wears crowns? Kings and queens. That's so true. And princesses. And princesses and princes. Yeah, that's true. So kings wear crowns, but what is a king? A boy. A ruler of the land. A boy. Those are both true. So a king rules a land or a country or a kingdom. Did you guys know that Jesus is a king? Yeah. yeah. Some of us knew, some of us didn't. Your God is in our hearts. And God is in our hearts. That's so true, Charlie. Um, so Jesus is a king, but he didn't rule a country. Did you guys know that? Yes, he ruled, he ruled everything. Everything, yeah, yeah. heaven. He's everyone's yeah. king. Oh, that's so sweet, John Cooley. Um, Jesus doesn't rule a country. Like Charlie said, Jesus rules our hearts. So if Jesus is the king of our hearts, what does that mean that we're supposed to do? Be kind to others. Be kind to others, yeah. Because you don't share toys because you don't want to Oh, yeah, sometimes it's hard to share toys, but we yeah. should, yeah. So Jesus is our king, which you means share, you ask the teacher. Yeah, you have to tell the teacher when someone doesn't share. Yeah. That's true. Um, Jesus is the king of our hearts. That means we follow Jesus, and so we should do what Jesus tells us to do, which is to be kind and to love everyone. So I have three crowns, so everyone gets one. There's one for Avery. Oh, you're going to take one You can have one too. Okay, here you go, Jared. Here's yours. And so now when you guys look at these crowns, you guys can remember that Jesus is king, okay? Okay, can we pray? Let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for your son, Jesus. Please help us to follow Jesus. Amen. All right, thank you guys for coming up with me. We can go back to our seats now. I'm happy getting in my hand. I know um, that is so sweet from the mouth of babies. Our scripture reading is from John 18. 33 through 37. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Pilate went back into the palace. He summoned Jesus and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate responded, I'm not a Jew. Am I? Your nation and its chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, My kingdom doesn't, sorry, my king, kingdom doesn't originate from this world. If it did, my guards would fight so that I would have been arrested by the Jewish leaders. My kingdom isn't from here. So, you are a king, Pilate said. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. I was born and came into the world for this reason, to testify to the truth. Whoever accepts the truth listens to my voice. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join. 
join us in the historic tree. stuff and everyone's like, how do we do this again? It's been a while. Let us be in a spirit of prayer. Holy Spirit, I pray over these words that they may not be mine, but they truly do glorify you. Allow us to know your heart and allow it to live through us, your hands and feet, as we receive your good news. Amen. If you're like me, I feel like so much of my list right now have just been getting longer and longer, and I have not really gotten any depth to it, right? It's like you start adding more, and you're like, oh, here's more. I think we felt that way at the food pantry this past week. There'd be cars, and we're like, okay, there's three more cars, and we turn to load up, and then there'd be three more cars behind that. Where did they come from? And at that point, we were just ready for a break. And so whenever we start thinking about all these goals and different responsibilities that we have, sometimes it's a great joy of getting to do those things. But then we have things on our list where you almost have to give yourself a reward in order to get it done. You're like, I have to call this utility company. So you're like, I'm saving this for the end of the day and maybe I'll grab a drink on the way home. Something, right? Because sometimes we really do feel that way. But we're like, do we really have to do that? And I can remember growing up and watching reruns at times, and of course there's a lot of classics out there. And one that I recall is Charles in Charge. Maybe you remember that one. It's about a young college student that has moved in with the Powell family and he's helping them be like a housekeeper and kind of a living. But it's also about him and his friend Buddy and how they tend to just to juggle everything. And it usually also involves some antics around love interest. But the theme song says, Charles in charge of our days and our nights. Charles in charge of our wrongs and our rights. And I want Charles in charge of me. And doesn't that sound delightful to have someone that is in charge of our wrongs and our rights? So someone who can help guide and lead us through life. As if there's that promise of saying, I can carry that load for you and you no longer have to make those hard choices. And it sounds quite familiar because we do, in fact, have someone who is in charge of that for us in our life. Of course, that would be God. That is Jesus. Today is Christ the King Sunday, when the church pauses to reflect on the significance of the truth that Jesus not only loves, cares, empathizes, comforts, and saves, but Jesus Christ rules. Jesus Christ has reign over us. Jesus Christ in word and deed and in the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension is God demonstrating that no matter how chaotic and difficult the world becomes, God is in charge. And even though we know this truth, we know that God is in charge, we often fail to behave as such. And I think we can give our humanity grace Yet it is a true struggle. So we think about our humanity, we are fragile. We can only carry so much of the load. When we feel that pressure, we respond to it, and it can come out in various ways. Of course, with strangers, we probably keep that hidden amongst ourselves because we don't want to reveal our true crazy. But then maybe people at work, they may be a pot glimpses of our hardships. Friends, of course, see it and maybe have experienced the full force of an action. But, oh, family, they know it all. They have seen us in our worst moments. They know all of our faults. They know it. You know, for daylight savings time, it has definitely been hitting our household very roughly. There has not been a day that Charlie has slept completely through the night. And so the other day, um, Friday night, Charlie decided at 3 a.m. it was time to party, that it was time to play. And of course, it wouldn't do with, why don't you just stay in your room, play with your toys for a minute, whatever, so you're going to crash, and we'll just stay in our room and sleep. No, that wasn't okay. We had to be present in the room, one of us at least, so he could play. 
And so it was my turn taking on that part of the evening. And of course, one of his toys fell behind a bookshelf. And at that point, I was retrieving it. And in that middle of the night, being woken up and sleeping, tears came and whining happened. And of course, I'm not talking about Charlie, I'm talking about myself. Because in that moment, I'm just like, I just want to sleep. Why am I retrieving a toy behind the bookshelf right now? We've had those moments where it's just these little things, they just kind of explode and we don't expect it. And sometimes it is that sleep deprivation. But the rest of the day, there was that little bit of a struggle because we were tired and we got up pretty much at 3 a.m. that day. And so we had to deal with our own responsibilities and we still had things to do. And so we felt frazzled and often wanting to respond as a tantrum like a toddler. But what does this have to do with anything? Because sometimes our worst is kept hidden. We feel like we are not enough, that we are not worthy to follow such a king. We feel torn down to the point that we don't know what to do anymore. Yet as Christians, we believe that times like this is when we actually should be feeling particularly vulnerable and powerless are the exact moments that we need to proclaim the reign of Jesus Christ, Savior, Redeemer, and also King. We recognize the power and hope that is present that says, yes, even when you feel like you are in the lowest moment of your life, God is saying, I am in charge of you and I will lift you up. In lectionary essays, they point out, in order to guide our reflection for this climatic Sunday, the lectionary gives us this rather odd gospel reading. Do we see Jesus as a kingly glory, transfigured and dazzling in a mountaintop? Do we watch him rise from the waters of baptism and heaven thundering in his ears? Or do we listen and witness one of his more spectacular miracles? No, our king doesn't appear in any of those majestic guises. Instead, the Gospel of John offers a picture of Jesus at his physical and emotional worst. Arrested, disheveled, harassed, hungry, abandoned, sleep deprived, and standing before the notoriously cruel Pontius Pilate for questioning. If we were going to write about Jesus in a kingly scenario, this would probably not be it. But here's the astonishing reality. If there is any story about Jesus that can smack all smugness out of us, all arrogance, all gleefulness, all scorn, this is it. Because this week our king is arrested and falsely accused as a criminal. He's a dead man walking. His chosen path to glory is humility, surrender, brokenness, and loss. But what does any of this have to do with our current crisis of truth and untruth? Consider the exchange that takes place between Jesus and Pilate. Are you a king? Pilate asked Jesus repeatedly, probably annoyed. Perhaps this peasant is taking up his valuable time on a tense and busy weekend in the city. You say that I am king, Jesus answers cryptically, implying both that Pilate's question is maybe the wrong one and that Pilate's assumptions about power and kingship aren't important when it comes to the ways of God. Then Jesus continues, For this I come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Don't you get it? Christ doesn't do politics. There's no connection for expectations for the words and actions of those who hold political power and for our standards for basic Christian behavior. Thank goodness for that, because our world would look a lot different if that was the truth in it. The claims of Christ don't always apply to these most vulnerable, like, grubby world of political power. But what is the truth our world holds today? This is here. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. So everyone who belongs, who is that? As we know, Jesus died on the cross for all. So this means all and that everyone belongs in a Christian family. As a church, we often pray the prayer of confession. And with the one that is used typically with Holy Communion, merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. 
and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is part of the heart of our faith. As we confess our shortcomings, we hear how we have also placed Jesus into the position of power. Jesus is Lord. We are to claim Jesus as Lord and to freely submit our will to his, to humbly profess that he is who is in charge of this world. And we pray for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So not only are we asking to be an obedient being to these laws, but we also have to do it joyfully. Do we really have to? We do, because obedience is a word we tend to ignore these days. We don't always understand what it means, because even in Christian circles, I think it feels confining and maybe even oppressive, but it doesn't leave room for our own choices and our own personalities, and it seems a little old-fashioned. But if we actually look at the word obedience, it comes from the Latin word meaning both to obey and to listen. The prefix O means in the direction of. So obedience then should maybe come up with the image of leaning towards somebody, straining to hear what they are saying. So listening intently enough that your posture leans in toward God, waiting to hear the next word. It is also, of course, a good description of our Christian life, a long leaning in towards God. A long leaning in toward God is a joyful life. Not happy at every moment, not rid of all fear, not safe from stumbling and sinning again, but joyfully obedient. Leaning in towards God to listen with trust and hope beyond the confines of the moment in which we find ourselves. So what is weighing us down, keeping us from experiencing that joyful obedience? Maybe we need to be praying this prayer by Reverend Governor Lewis. Free us to listen to our own, your own voice, God, and to lean in even more when we can't hear you well. Free us from our own desires when they are not for your desire for us. Free us from the pain and the incompleteness of the world in which we live, so that we may live here, now, joyfully aware that there is a deeper reality into which you call us even now. Free us soldiers from extorting those in our care. Free us tax collectors from greed. Free those of us with two coats so that we can joyfully give away one of them to someone who is in need. Free us to make room at our tables for those who are hungry. Free us for your joyful obedience, God, because there's no other joy than what we find in our lives when we lean in closer toward you. But when we return to this passage, along comes Jesus standing up to Pontius Pilate, Jesus of the house and lineage of King of David, Jesus claiming to have rule and influence over every area of human life, everything. Because of this idea, Christ is in charge and Pontius Pilate is not. And this is really strange and bizarre for us because it goes against our grain of thinking. Politics is part of everything, even the church. And the love of God isn't relevant to our lives unless it's that powerful love that God demonstrates. Pilate's response echoes down to us across the ages, a question to end all ages. What is truth? We'll never know if he's asking out of contempt, curiosity, hunger, or anger. But it doesn't matter. Jesus does not respond. That is, he doesn't respond with words. He doesn't engage Pilate in some sort of philosophical dialogue or offer any kind of hiding statements that we can now slap on stickers or bumper and stickers. Instead, he replies with his whole of his life. If you're looking at it, his silence implies, you're looking at the truth. I am the truth. In other words, truth isn't an instrument, a weapon, or a slogan. We are looking at the truth in Jesus, the life of Jesus, the way of Jesus, the love of Jesus. That is the complex truth. This is our king. Can we stand for truth as he does? Can we belong to truth as he does? Can we tell and keep telling the beautiful, hard-cut, joy-filled, pain-filled, powerfully undeniable stories that we find in our scriptures? 
Soon you will enter the Advent season of waiting and longing and listening. Soon you will walk into this expectant darkness waiting for the light to dawn. We will look for the truth to reveal itself in the first cries of a vulnerable baby. To redefine kingship, authority, and power forever. That is what happens when Jesus enters the scene. Yes, we have good reasons to fear the erosion of truth. But we also know and trust that the king who reigns will not abandon us. That truth will survive, and it has died and returned to life already. And it lives. So I just added this this morning, this part, because it was a scenario that had happened. But in this new edition here, I was going over my sermon of Chase. That is a perk of having a clergy spouse of saying, does this make sense? Is this okay? And Charlie was overhearing us as I was talking about it, and he came over and he said, hey, I'm the boss. Now, do I think that Charlie was maybe questioning God's reign and Jesus' reign? No. He was questioning his dear parents and our authority, just as we often do. Children have that way of testing parents. But it ultimately left me pondering how we do this with our Creator. How we may struggle to be the boss. And how we say, hey, I'm the one actually in charge, when the truth or not. So instead of silently trying to control the struggle, we ask, who is in charge? Which usually is an indication that we fear that things may be out of control and that solving our problems, possible problems are probably not possible, and that chaos and helplessness is our destiny. But forget the power struggle and submit to the reign of Christ our Lord. Because Christ in charge of our days and our nights, Christ in charge of our wrongs and our rights, and I want Christ in charge of me. In the name of the King, Ruler, and Spirit of Truth, Amen. Now we invite Cheryl to come up for the affirmation of faith. <laughs> Please join in this historic creed of our faith found on page 881 in the Pentagon. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in the Lord and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the Pontius Pilate, was crucified and buried in the earth. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand. God the Almighty, from the midst of the church, the judges, the bring the living. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You're invited to stand as you're able for. We gather together on page 131 of the hymnal.
We are glad that you came and worshiped with us today. Again, lots of great activities happening after the church service. So you're invited down to go down to the fellowship hall where we will have stone soup. And then afterwards, we'll start decorating for Christmas. And so at this point, we are excited. I'll close out our service. And it looks like we might have a guest here in a second. <laughs> so, Lord, we give thanks for this week that we're able to come and gather. May we go out with grateful hearts and thankful hearts and know that you are the ruler of all. Lord, we give thanks and we go out proclaiming your news. Amen. And it looks like you have a friend. I'm going to direct your attention in case. <laughs> 